Hey, hey, church family, glad to be with you today for Church at Home. Today we're continuing our series, Hotel or Hospital, all about God's heart for His church. What we're going to learn today is that many people are turned off by church because they fear people will be shocked by their struggles. But the truth is, Jesus is not nearly as shocked as we are when people live outside of the life that He has created for us. And He actually models to us what it looks like to offer both truth and grace to those around us. And so I'm excited to dive into that today, but we're going to start this morning with some worship. Would you join me as I pray? Lord, thank you so much for the example that you set for us in your word. God, that you've given us a way that we can reach those people in our corner. Thank you for loving us, God, when we were so far away from you. I pray that as we go through this message today, we will learn to adopt some of what you've shown us, that truth that grace, God, that we can find out that they're not independent or at odds with one another, but rather they're things that we can offer those around us together. So I pray that you help to form us into better examples of your love towards us. We love you. We dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm 
to the Lord most high. Cause all praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever.
Amen. Always such a joy to worship God together. Well, again, I'm so glad to spend this time with you wherever and whenever you're watching. Thanks for being a part of our Captivate at Home family. At Captivate, we really want to help you get connected. The best way to get connected is on our website, CaptivateSD.com. There you can join a community, sign up to serve, and request prayer. You can also do that by emailing info at CaptivateSD.com. A couple weeks ago, we shared the exciting news that we are officially launching Captivate Homeschool. We've got such a passion for our kids here at Captivate, and our vision with Captivate Homeschool is not only to help our kids develop, grow, and learn, but also to raise them in the truth of God's Word. Enrollment is currently open for kids ages 1 through 4, and space is limited, so you're going to want to make sure you sign up soon. For more info, such as scheduling and pricing, or to enroll, you can email homeschool at CaptivateSD.com. And finally, I just want to remind you that you can continue to support the work that God is doing here at Captivate through your giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says that we're going to be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. So it's our joy to give back to a God that gave first and that has blessed us first. You can give online at CaptivateSD.com. Again, we're so glad that you're with us this morning. We hope that this message blesses and encourages you. What's up, church family? Happy Sunday. I'm so glad to be with you today. After a week off, I got twice the energy. I'm going to be twice as loud. Listen, if I'm yelling, I'm not mad at you, all right? I'm just excited to be with you. And I'm excited to continue the series we started last week. It's called Hotel or Hospital. Hotel or Hospital. We're studying, really, what is church all about? What is Jesus' church actually? Is it more like a hotel or is it more like a hospital? You know, in 2018, when we started the church, some people asked us, why another church and why San Diego? And I'm like, have you been to San Diego? Maybe not, if you're asking that question, right? We were just glad God didn't call us to like Arkansas or something like that. And if you're from Arkansas, God loves you, all right? I just don't. No, I'm just kidding. I do. I just don't want to live there, all right? We love San Diego. It's a beautiful place, but what we found out is there actually needed more churches. When we started the church, only 5% of people in our city had a church home. If every seat in every church was full, there'd be over a million people without a seat. And this is America's finest city, and yet it had a lot of issues. It was the eighth highest population of human traffic people, the fourth highest population of homeless people, addiction, anxiety, divorce, all on the rise. And it's like, this place is so beautiful, but its people hurt a lot. And so all we said to God was, we said, you know what, man, while we're on our shift, like San Diego's been here a lot longer than we have. It's probably going to be here after we're gone. While you give us these years to serve this place and serve this community, just not on our shift, not, not on our shift. We're going to do everything we can to destroy the works of the devil, to end spiritual loneliness, to make sure that every person's on a corner card, that they're led to Jesus, they're invested in, and they're prayed for. And we want to see that everybody has a church home. That's what we want to see. We want to make sure that people know not just how to believe in Jesus, but how to follow him. We think there's a big difference between being saved and being captivated. In fact, we like to say this, to be saved is to know that one day I'll go to heaven, but to be captivated is to know that today heaven's coming to me. I get to see God move, not just in eternity, but in history in my life. Why? Because I do what he says to do. I obey him and I follow him and I get to see him move. And as a believer, that's what we should long for, to see God move. You know, at the end of your life, the things that you'll remember most are not the things you can take credit for. They're not the things with your name on them. They're the things that only God could do. He took away cancer. I've seen that. He took away pain. He reconciled a marriage. He helped you forgive the person who's hurt you more than anybody else. This is what God is in the business of doing. And we expect him to continue to do this at this church at a hospital. At a hospital, that's what God does here, but it kind of starts with recognizing we need that, with being real and recognizing we need all of those things. And I think that's honestly a massive problem in church today, is that church often becomes a place where we don't act like that. I'm not really in need. My life's kind of put together. Often church is a place where we come and act like we're better than we really are. We just kind of stuff our issues away. And we pick and choose parts of our story and what we're going through, and we kind of just create our own image and our own narrative. And I just want to tell you today, that's not actually Christianity. Christianity is not cosmetic surgery where I cut pieces out of my story. That's not what it is. That's fake. That's not what faith is. In fact, here's what faith is. Faith is not a denial of reality. It's a deeper reality than the one that I see. And it actually governs the way I live my life. It's the unseen 
It, it's faith. It determines where I walk, but it doesn't ignore where I've been. It doesn't ignore the hard things that I've gone through in my life. But the problem is we kind of like to ignore them. You know, I don't really want to be that real. <laughs> I don't want to get judged. I don't want to be corrected by super Bible guy 52. You know, like I'm not interested in that. I think sometimes that's a fear. I think another fear is if I share what's really going on, maybe people won't care. I think that's a fear people have. But the one I want to talk about today is this. I think a lot of times we don't open up in church. We're not necessarily real because we have this fear that if people really knew who I was, if they really knew what I was going through, they would be shocked. Like they would be shocked and they couldn't believe it. And that's why I think as the church, here's what we need to work on. We need to work on not being shocked when we discover that people are actually struggling. <laughs> and with that, I want to go ahead and jump into our Bible story today. We're going to be in John chapter 8. If you've got a Bible, you can pull it out. If not, it's going to be up here on the screen. A little bit of context. All right. At this point in the gospel story, the Bible says there's a division amongst the church. All right? the, the church people are having a disagreement. And the disagreement is over, who is this guy, Jesus? Like, is he really the son of God, or is he just a nice guy? Like, we need to decide. Like, should we get down on our knees and worship him, or should we kill him? We need to make a decision. And there were some people in the church who didn't like Jesus, man, because he was kind of different. You know, Jesus hung out with bad people, the Bible says, people who were known for their sin. He hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes, and like, he cared about people who needed help. And so there were people in church who were like, I don't really like that. You know, like if Jesus does that and he's our leader, I'm going to need to do that. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> I kind of like my place of honor at the church. I don't really want to be a servant. I kind of like being above people. I kind of like getting that extra attention. I don't really want to be like this guy. He's kind of lowly. You know, he lives this life where he hangs out with anybody and he meets with it. I, I don't really want to do that. And so they're having this discussion, this disagreement about who Jesus really is and what do we do with him. I don't really like the way that he acts. And so Jesus takes this moment right here in John chapter eight and he reminds the church leaders who are struggling what church is all about. And here's what he says. Here's the story, John chapter eight and verse one. It says this, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the church, at the temple. A crowd gathered and he sat down and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law, the church leaders, the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And here's what they did. They put her in front of the whole crowd, in front of the whole church. That's weird, all right? Like, I don't know if that's somebody's worst, you know, that's your worst fear when you come to church. Like, I'm gonna call out your sin. If you struggle with this, you get down here right now so we can stare at you. Like, that would be really weird. That's actually what's happening here. Verse four, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Can you believe that? I mean, they're shocked. Can you believe she would do that? Verse five, the law of Moses says we should kill her, we should stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust something with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, and so he stood up again. He said, all right, let's do it like this. Let the one who's never sinned, why don't you throw the first stone? Then he stooped down again, and he wrote, and the dust, and when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, kind of sneakily, all right, a little bit embarrassed. They just kind of snuck away, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again. He said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Verse 11, last verse. No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. In fact, go and sin no more. What an awkward moment, all right? <laughs> this woman gets called out in front of the whole church for her sin. That's a really tough moment. And the Pharisees are flabbergasted. They can't believe she did this. Like, can you believe that she struggles with this? I'm totally, I mean, I'm just totally blown. I can't believe that she struggles with it. In fact, she's not invited to my small group. She doesn't need to be here anymore. I mean, they're just totally shocked. And it's interesting that in the middle of them being shocked, it's interesting to see how Jesus reacts because even though they're shocked, he wasn't shocked. He wasn't shocked. He wasn't shocked. In fact, it's speaking of being shocked. Have you ever been shocked in your life? Maybe there's been something that's happened to you recently that just kind of left you in shock. Maybe you got a bill in the mail and you're like, wow, that's how much I spent at that store. Okay, that's a little shocking. Maybe like me, you've stepped on the scale recently and you're like, wow, how did that happen? All right. 
the COVID-15, for some of us it was like the COVID-25, I don't know, just depends on who you are. It's like, how did all that happen? I'm not really sure. Maybe one time you had a loved one uh, get a haircut, but they didn't tell you, and maybe they changed a little bit more than you'd have thought. I've had that happen to me before. You see a person who got a haircut, you're like, whoa! No, I love it. I really do. I, I love it. How many know that's not you loving it, all right? Sometimes we need to react better. That's not very helpful, but... I remember this one time, I was really shocked. It was actually the first time we took our daughter, Zayla, out in public after my wife gave birth to her. And my my daughter now, Zayla Bell, she's 20 months old. She's beautiful, she's single, and staying that way. Can I get an amen, all right? Little boys can kick rocks. Anyway, I love her, and we took her out. And of all places, uh, the first time we took her out, we took her to Costco. And that's what we do when we're bored. We go to Costco. I love Costco. Anybody love Costco? I love Costco. I think it's going to be Costco in heaven, samples all day. The chicken bake's going to be on sample. Anyway, we go to Costco, and the Costco near our house, when you leave, there's two lanes to get onto the street. The left lane has to turn left, or so we thought, (laughs) and the the middle lane, or I should say the right lane, you could turn left or right. Well, we're in the right lane, and we're turning left. There's a car next to us. They're also turning left. They have to. Again, or else I thought they did. And and as we're in the middle of the intersection, this guy who's right next to me, he whips over all the way to the right, tries to cut across the intersection, and just hits us full speed. And he hit us so hard in the middle of this intersection that actually totaled my wife's car. And that's saying a lot because it was her car. If it was my car, that wouldn't be very surprising at all. You get a flat tire, that thing's totaled. But anyway, it was her car, and he hit us really hard. And it was crazy. I said, what happened? He said, my Uber thing, my, my maps spoke to me and said to turn right. I'm like, we listen to our phones too much. He didn't even look. He just said, the thing said turn right. He turned right into us. And that shocked me because we live in the United States of America, like where we have lanes and lights and signs, and it's very organized. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a third world country, but sometimes they don't have all that. I- I've been to a few third world countries, and sometimes they don't have lanes They don't have signs. Uh, They don't have, you know, like traffic lights and all that kind of stuff. In fact, I remember one time I was in this third world country and I was in a car with a missionary and and we were in this like two lane street and in these two lanes, there's like four cars and seven motorcycles. It was totally nuts and totally insane. And I looked at him, I said, you guys must have a lot of car accidents here. And he said, actually, not really. I said, what? He said, yeah, actually. He said, you know what country has the most car accidents in the world? the United States of America, over 6 million car accidents happen in our country every year. And he said, in fact, according to World Atlas, all right, the U.S. is not in the top 25 safest countries to drive in. And that shocked me. I said, what? That doesn't make any sense. He said, no, actually, it makes a lot of sense. Just think about it. He said, just think about it. Here, when people speed up or they cut across lanes or they don't stop at signs, we kind of expect it. We're not really shocked. We're not surprised. We're actually looking for it. He said, but in the United States, people have an expectation of how people should drive. And when people cut across lanes, when they speed up, when they run a light, when they run a stop sign maybe, you're not ready for it. In fact, it shocks you. It shocks you because you're not really expecting it. You have an expectation of how people should drive. And I think a lot of times it's the same thing that happens when people walk into church. You know, sometimes we have an expectation of how people should live. You know, people walk into church, and in church, there's people who know the Bible really well. There's people who grew up in church who, you know, maybe they're great leaders, and they claim to be close to God. And so we have an expectation of how people should live. We know what they should struggle with and what they shouldn't struggle with. We know what should be difficult and maybe what really what shouldn't be very difficult, right? We know what they should stay away from. But when we find out that people are living outside the lines of Christianity, if you will, it kind of shocks us. It shocks us. But let me tell you this about Jesus. Jesus is not nearly as shocked as we are when people live outside of the lines that he's created for us. He's not shocked when people do that. We are. You know, it's like he did what with who? They, They had an affair with who? They struggle with anxiety? They have that. And we're like, what? We're shocked. We can't believe sometimes that people struggle and they have a hard time. Jesus is not shocked. He knows that that's part of the deal with us. It's part of the deal with people. We're sinners and we kind of sin. I remember when I was in high school, I played football and I was a receiver. And every time I'd have a flag called on me, you get like pass interference or something, I'd be shocked. And I was, had a big mouth and I was always chirping at the refs. And my coach would always say, hey, be quiet. He said, coach is coach, players play, refs ref. And let me tell you, sin or sin, man, that's just part of it. It's part of it. It's something that we're fighting. It's something we need to work on 
all the time, but Jesus knows that. He's not actually shocked, but sometimes we are. We hear about what people struggle with, and we're like, you did what? With who? Where? Oh, no. Like, we'll pray for you, man. Like, I don't know how we're going to get through that. That's kind of crazy. And sometimes we have really swift judgment of people. And I think we actually make this mistake. I think our swift judgment of others might make us look holier to people, but not to God. God's not impressed with that. God's not fooled with that. We're like, man, if I condemn sin quickly, God might, you know, he might see that. Other people might see that. No, God's not impressed with that. You just look more in loving to God. You look a little bit legalistic or religious to God. He's not really actually impressed with that. In fact, now you're in the way. Sometimes our judgments get in the way of God healing and connecting with people. You don't want to get in the way of Jesus connecting with his people. And the problem is that's where these guys are at in John chapter 8. They're getting in the way of Jesus healing this woman. And they have two very different motivations. You know, they want to kill her. Jesus wants to heal her. And I would ask you that. When you're shocked, when you hear about, you know, someone in your life, you can't believe they did that. What's your motivation? Do you want to kill them? Do you want to excommunicate them? Do you want to not talk to them anymore? Or do you want to help them out? Do you want to help them get to Jesus so they can get healing? And, and they had this wrong motivation. And so Jesus has to remind them, the leaders of the church, he's got to remind them what this thing called church is actually all about. And to do that, Jesus stoops down in the dirt and he writes something in the sand. And we don't know what Jesus wrote in the sand. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I have a theory. I have a theory. I have a theory because we actually do get their reactions. I don't know what Jesus wrote, but we do get their reactions. What do they do? They slip away kind of sneakily, starting with the oldest. I don't know. They just kind of seem embarrassed to me. It seemed like they're just kind of slipping out, and, and I wonder why. Well, what could have Jesus wrote in the sand? Well, maybe he wrote down their names in the sand, starting with the oldest, John A., John B., John C., and just maybe, I just have this thought, what if he wrote down one of their worst sins? You know, John A., man, you're greedy. John B., you committed adultery, you've cheated, and he just started writing things down. And as he's writing them down, they're like, whoa, you knew about that? You, you knew about that, and they were kind of shocked. And as, as they find out that he knows about that, they're like, they're trying to get out. They're like, did you hear the phone ring? Like, I, you know, I, I need to go get the phone. It's like, there's no cell phones in 30 AD, all right? It's like, yeah, but I have a lunch meeting. I need to get out of here. They're, they're just trying to get out of that place. They're kind of embarrassed. They're embarrassed. And it's interesting. They leave, and what you notice is they actually leave their stones. For some reason, they didn't need their stones anymore to condemn this woman. Why? Because remembering what I was saved from sometimes can take the shock away of what others need saving from now. Remembering my story from the past can help us give grace for the people's story in the present. When I remember what God saved me from, hoping that what was a past for me is going to be a past for them because God's going to heal them. And I struggled with stuff in the past. Maybe this is their past that they're going to live out one day, they'll look back and say, I used to struggle with that, and God healed me. Sometimes that gives us grace for people when we hear their story, when we know what they're going through. You know, the reality is people come into church, and they're all, we're all different. You know, maybe they didn't grow up in church. Maybe they don't look like you. Maybe they didn't grow up where you grew up. Maybe they don't know how to worship God. Maybe they have a mental illness. We just don't even know. But the problem is, is that sometimes it takes us hearing somebody's story to extend grace to them i got to hear their story. And the reality is when you hear somebody's story, everything changes. You know, on my street where I live, there's one house that doesn't look like any other house. <laughs> on my street, there's really nice houses, you know, that are expensive and all that. Then there's like decent houses that are kind of being fixed up. Then there's this one house, man, and it just doesn't look like any other house. And I remember when we were moving in, I'm like, what's up with this one house? You know, why don't they fix it up? Don't they know it's affecting everybody's home value? That's selfish. You know, I was getting kind of worked up. In fact, I actually called this house the haunted house. I haven't even met the people yet. And I called it the haunted house. And I thought it was really funny. I was telling other neighbors that. I'm like, hey, what's up with the haunted house? And we would laugh. And I had friends come over. And I'm like, hey, sorry about the haunted house. And I just thought it was funny. In fact, one day, I just wanted to know more about what's up with this house. And so I went to my other neighbor, who's like the neighborhood watch. I don't know if you have a guy like that. He's lived on our street for 70 years. He's retired. He knows everybody's business. He's around all the time. Again, I don't know if you have a neighbor like that. He's a great guy. He's actually on my corner card. I've been praying for him. I hope to see him in church one day. But I went and talked to him one day, and I said, hey, man, what's up with this haunted house? You know, what's up with them? Why don't they fix up their house? Don't they know that they're ruining our street, you know? <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, the Johnsons. 
not the Johnsons. He said, yeah, the, the Johnsons. He said, yeah, you know, there was a time when old man Johnson was fixing up the house, but then he stopped. And I said, why? Why did he stop, you know? He said, well, he stopped because he actually got cancer. And, you know, when, he, when that all happened, he just got kind of weak and he didn't have the energy. In fact, he stopped working so much, he didn't really have the money to fix it up. And, yeah, that's what happened. In fact, that was hard, but then the next year, Mrs. Johnson got cancer too. And that was really hard. He said they were fixing up their house, but then they stopped because now they're fighting for their life. I said, oh, did you hear the phone? Like, I just, I need to get out of here, man. Like that, I need to get out of here. Did you hear the phone? And in that moment, like everything changed for me. These people, these real people who were objects that were just like in the way of my happiness and my home value, all of a sudden they became real people with pains and problems and a story. And when you hear someone's story, sometimes that changes everything for you. And sometimes it's not until you hear their story that you can extend them grace. And let me tell you this about Jesus. Jesus doesn't want you to be that person. Jesus doesn't want you to be the person who has to hear somebody's story before extending grace. He wants you to be the person who does it ahead of time, who can do it up front. Because if you don't learn to do that, you're going to become like these Pharisees. These Pharisees in John chapter 8 who don't understand grace. They understand the Greek, but they don't understand grace. And so Jesus didn't really care. He wasn't very impressed. And because of that, when their imperfection gets exposed, now they need to walk away. Now they need to leave. And that's the irony of the story. You know, I think some people read this and they think, man, this is Jesus kicking people out of church, you know? Get out of here, you jerks. You have no grace. Like, don't come back. I don't think that's what's happening at all. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here at all. In fact, Jesus is, what he's doing is he's leveling the playing field. He's saying, I want you guys to be here, but I need you to understand that you and her are in the same boat. You have some good behavior. You have some good knowledge. That's great, but you both need me. You both need grace. He was just kind of leveling the playing field. And in this moment when Jesus is about to pour out so much grace to this woman, I think he wants to pour out just as much grace to them because they needed it too. He he wanted to give them grace because he loved them too. But the problem is, is they don't go to that church. They don't think that way. That's not the kind of community that they build. They didn't give grace like that. And so what do they do? They walk away in guilt and shame. They're incapable of receiving grace from Jesus because they don't give it away. And I think sometimes we can get caught up in that. In fact, I'll say it like this. You will often only receive grace from Jesus to the level you give it away. It doesn't need to be like that, but it's just true. When you don't give it away, it's hard for you to receive it because you'll be even harder on yourself. These guys don't give grace because they don't understand it. Because they don't understand it, therefore they don't receive it, and they walk away empty-handed. And because of that, this moment where I think Jesus wants to give them so much grace, they actually just get rebuked. It's a tough moment. It could have been a good moment. It's just a tough moment because Jesus has to remind them of this thing called mercy. (laughs) And you don't want God to have to remind you of this thing called mercy. Mercy. In fact, he had to do that again in Matthew chapter 9. In fact, Sam preached about it last week, Matthew chapter 9. Jesus hanging out with some tax collectors, some people who are known for their mistakes. That's tough. And as he's hanging out with these people, the Pharisees are in the corner and they're just watching. They're creeping. They're creeping on Jesus' Instagram story and they're mad about it. They're like, he's hanging out with these people. What's he doing? It's a bad look. This is not what leaders do. And again, they didn't like that because if he's doing that and he's God, that means they need to do that. And they don't like that. They're like, Jesus, I like the church I go to. I like the way things are now. At my church, I'm honored above people. At my church, I have a reserved parking space. Please don't change this for me. I like the way things are. And as they're in the corner and they're angry, Jesus seems to walk over to them in Matthew 9 and he gives them a little talk and he says, I need to remind you about what this whole thing's all about. I need to remind you about what church is all about. And here's what he says. He says, you guys need a reminder. So I'll tell you, he says, I'm like a doctor at a hospital. (laughs) I'm a doctor at a hospital. And you guys tell me, do sick people feel guilty for being sick at a hospital? I hope not because it wouldn't be a very good hospital. In fact, I can't have people feeling guilty for being sick because then they won't open up and they won't be real. And they'll act like the problems they have are not actually there. And I can't afford that because people aren't going to get any better. They won't open up. They won't go through shame and things they're struggling with. In fact, I'll say this, to get to true healing, you often have to pass through shame 
on the way. You got to pass through the hard stuff. You got to open up about what's real. You never get treated for it. You can't get treated for an issue that you act like isn't there. That's not what doctors do. Right? You might have the best doctor in the world. And he's like, you need surgery. And you're like, no, I'm good. He's not going to knock you out and put you under. He might lose his license. You know, like doctors don't do that. Jesus could do that for you, but he often doesn't do that because he wants you to see it first. He wants you to want it. Jesus doesn't just want to heal you. He wants you to teach. He wants to teach you how to get healed. He wants you to want it. He, he doesn't want to hold your hand your whole life. He wants, to, you know, wants to see you grow up. He wants you to want it. He wants you to want it. And so Jesus, he shows them, this is kind of what church is. And what's interesting is this is all happening at church. I mean, there's a bunch of people watching this. And Jesus says, hey, let me take this opportunity to remind you what church is. It's like a hospital. In fact, let me tell you what your role is in church, and that's a good question. What's your role in this hospital? Let me tell you what I think my role is in this hospital that I work at called Captivate. When people come into the hospital I work at called Captivate, I see myself as a doctor's assistant. All right, they come in, I give them a warm welcome, I connect with them, you give them some coffee, you help them find a place to sit down, and here's what you tell them. Hey, you sit right here and you wait right here. Dr. J, the God man, is about to come meet with you. And he wants to heal you, and he wants to change your life. But way too often, we grab the clipboard, and we start playing doctor, and we start diagnosing things in people's life, sometimes even before we deserve it. We're like, you know what, Tom? This looks pretty bad. I don't know. Poor Tom's like, what? And yeah, I've, I mean, I haven't seen a case like this in a while. <sighs> looks pretty bad, Tom. Poor Tom's just sitting there like, I'm waiting to meet with God. And we just kind of take the clipboard and kind of just speak into his life, and sometimes it's good to speak into people's life if you've earned it, but sometimes we haven't earned it. Let me tell you something about God. God doesn't need to earn the right to speak into people's lives. We do, all right? God created people. He doesn't need to earn the right to speak into my life, but sometimes I do. Sometimes it's the worst when we judge or speak into people's life and we haven't earned it. People are like, here's what you should have done. You're like, what's your name? I don't know. That's just, sometimes that's just not helpful, and, and we might be trying to help. But I think Jesus wants his job back. He says, I want to diagnose people. Let me relieve you of that duty. And he wants people to know what? There's grace here. There is grace here no matter where you come from, no matter what you believe. But, but, there's a huge but in the story. <laughs> Jesus doesn't just stop at grace. He actually goes on to something else. You know, whenever I've heard this story or passage preached. It's been a while, all right? But in the years past, when I've heard people talk about this passage, there's always a part that's left out, at least in my experience. There's always a line that's just kind of left out, and it's the last thing that Jesus says. Jesus gives all of this grace, and at the very end, he says something. He says this, go and sin no more. He actually corrects her, and we don't like that part as much. <laughs> that's not as much fun. It's not as much about Grace, Jesus corrects her, and here's what he's doing. He's not saying, hey, go live whatever life you want. I don't care. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying at all. Jesus doesn't condemn her, but he also doesn't compromise. I think there's a big pressure in church today and amongst Christians to compromise the truth, to compromise what God really said for this thing that we call grace, and really it's more like tolerance. It's like I just want to be nice to everybody, and we kind of take grace out of it. We, I should say we take truth out of it a little bit. But the problem with that is what you find out is that grace and truth go together. Biblical grace is accompanied by its best friend. It's called truth. Jesus is grace personified and Jesus is truth personified. And you actually need both. And that's what Jesus says. In John 14, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. Nobody. There's not many roads to God. There's not many roads to heaven. He says, no one gets to the Father except through what? The truth. Meaning you don't get to God. You don't get to healing without first stopping through the truth. And so giving grace to someone that you don't give the truth to, I'm not sure that's love. That's actually not grace. It's called tolerance. And let me just give you my take on tolerance. Our culture has made a big deal about it, about, about tolerance and you know, let people live and let them love, whatever. And we make a really, really big deal about it. Here's my opinion on it. I think it's an overreaction to what was a church problem and perhaps is a church problem in many instances. It's a church issue that people have been so tired for years of churches and Christian people stuffing the Bible down their throat, gasping for air when they find out that people aren't perfect and they're struggling. And I think people for so long just got sick of that. 
And I said, I'm just sick of this, man. We're not dealing with this anymore. Let's just give people grace. Let's just let them live. And truth, I don't know. That's kind of optional. <laughs> what is truth? Is there a truth? I don't know. In fact, you have your own truth. Why don't you just do you? That's your truth. And it's this thing that we kind of made up, and it's not true at all. We've actually overemphasized one at the expense of the other, and you can't do that. You know, everyone, you know, typically often we lean towards one, grace or truth, but the reality is you need both. Jesus is both, and you need both. They go together, and here's why. Here's why. Truth without grace is mean, but grace without truth is meaningless. I mean, let's all be honest about truth without grace. That's mean. We just want to club people. You know, I've known a lot of people that as they get closer to God, as they learn the Bible more and more, they just use it as a weapon to beat people with it. And that's not really what it was meant for. When you read Ephesians 6, it talks about the armor of God. And the word of God is called the sword of the spirit. And that sword is meant to defeat the enemy in your life, defeat temptation in your life. It's not meant for you to use on other people. Maybe sometimes if it can encourage or correct you know, in an encouraging way, but we shouldn't be beating people with it. Truth without grace can be really mean. But what, what do we know on the other end? Grace without truth doesn't, it's meaningless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, there's a show that Monica and I watch on TV, and it's about a very specific addiction in people's life. And doctors say with this specific addiction, there's always an enabler. There's always someone that helps in their life. And it's always someone who loves them who's really close to them. And because they love them so much, they just keep giving them the substance. And in some cases, these people don't make it. They pass away. And whenever that happens, you're left in this really interesting place as a viewer where you have to think, was that really love? Ah, it's tough. I, I get the dilemma. I'm not mad at these people, but it's tough. They loved them. They graced them all the way to their end. And you're like, I don't know. There wasn't a lot of truth in that. They didn't really necessarily help them get any Better, why? Because they didn't give them the truth. And that's why Jesus gives her both. He gives her so much grace, but he says, I gotta give you the truth too, why? Because I, I wanna help you out. I don't wanna leave you where you are. And so he gives her both. But here's what we notice. Jesus gives her grace first. And I gotta tell you today, grace comes first. Grace comes first. Jesus doesn't speak in her life without first protecting and caring for her. And here's what Jesus models. Jesus protects before he corrects. He protects, he encourages, he loves, he hugs before he corrects. And that's a big deal. He clears her of all shame and guilt. He gets rid of the accusers, and then he gets down in the dirt with her right where she's at. I just got to tell you today, that is what ministry is all about. It's about getting down in the dirt. It's a message coming soon. It's, a, you know, it's, it's where we get down where people are in the mess, in the struggle. Sometimes we think ministry is really glamorous and fan No, no, no. The real work of ministry is not just done on stages with LED screens and microphones. That's not really what it's all about. You got to get down where people are. If you want to serve God, if you want to serve people, you cannot be afraid to get a little mud on you. You got to get down where people are. You know, it's whenever I'm on a phone call with somebody in our church, maybe one of you, and we're talking about, you know, how someone's going through a divorce or unemployment or depression. And in that moment, I always get a reminder from God, this is what I called you to. This is what I called you to to be a pastor. It's not just that thing you do every week with a microphone. That's a good thing, but don't do the microphone thing without the telephone thing. I need you to be close to people's pain. I need you to get down in the dirt. Jesus is in the dirt. He's working with her wound. He's trying to take obstacles and judgment away from her so she can connect with God and the truth. And he's giving her grace first before he gives her the truth. And that's important. Why? Because people need to know that you love them first. They need to know you love them first. And I'm learning this. You don't want to give somebody feedback until they know you believe in them, until they know that you love them or it's not going to be very effective. In fact, it's just going to come off as judgment. And I'll say this. There's a fine line between judgment and truth, and that line is called love. Love. Do they feel love? Not do you think you gave love. That's not the most important thing. Do they actually feel love? Sometimes they don't. You know, and it's not always going to work out perfectly, but that's the goal. That's what you should be fighting for. Do they know that I believe in them? Now, she doesn't feel that from the church folks, <laughs> not even a little bit. These guys are embarrassing her in front of all these people at church. She doesn't feel loved by them, right? Why? Because they're giving her feedback in public. And here's what I think Jesus models. Another thing we need to know, give grace in public, give truth in private. Give grace in public, give truth in 
private. It's an important thing to know. Now, there's a rare occurrence where you need to correct somebody publicly, and that's when other people get discouraged or led astray. Sometimes you need to address something publicly, but 97% of the time, giving truth in private works best. And again, ultimately, Jesus gives her both. Why? Because it's a hospital. That's what you do at a hospital. In fact, here's the last one. Here's my heart for our church and what a hospital is. At a hospital, you shouldn't get judged. You shouldn't feel guilty for being sick, but you also don't leave without getting better, without getting the truth. It's family and then freedom. Those are our first two values as a church, family freedom and following, family freedom, purpose in your life. Those are the three, and, and, and they're in order on purpose, family and then freedom. Jesus loves you so much. He meets you where you are, wherever that is but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. He wants to get you free in your life. That's what he wants for you. And it starts with you being real and opening up and knowing what? You can struggle here. You can struggle here. I just need you to know that today. You can struggle here. We're not gonna gasp for air. We're working on that. We're not doing that anymore. I cannot have you acting like your issue doesn't exist. You're never gonna get healing. You're never gonna get freedom. I need you to feel at home, loved, so that you can open up and Jesus can correct you. The Holy Spirit can convict you by his word. I want you to know this church is big enough for you and it's big enough for the people in your life. There's a reason we talk about this corner card so much. It's the heartbeat of our church. There are people in your life, they're far from God. And they might not know God, they might not know how to worship. Maybe they used to be in church and they're kind of embarrassed to not be. I just need you to know, church, our church is big enough for them, the people in your life. In fact, I'll end with this story. I remember when I was in college, I was going to this church, the first church I was ever part of when I was in college, and I loved this church. And there was this girl in our friend group, and she grew up in church, but she wasn't around anymore. In fact, her father had passed away, and it was a really hard season for her. And so she kind of went off and, you know, totally lived a life apart from Jesus. And we had invited her to church a bunch of times, and we said, you know what, let's just pray. Let's just pray and ask that she, God that he'd move on her life and in her heart and she'd respond and, and come to church. And I think I actually, for a great long season, I just never thought she would ever come back. Well, one day I get a text from a friend that said, hey, she's coming today. She's coming to church. It was Sunday morning. We're like, what? This is crazy. It's an answer to prayer. And so some of us got there early, you know, to help her come into church because it can be intimidating to walk into church by yourself. I've experienced that before. I don't know if you have... Uh, in your life. And so we said, we're going to get there early. We're going to wait outside and we're going to walk in with her. Here she comes up. She comes walking up. She's a little bit late and we didn't care. And she comes up and I'm telling you, man, it's like she still had the outfit on from the night before <laughs> when she was at the club. She smelled kind of like alcohol. Uh, she wasn't wearing an outfit that her grandma would approve of. Okay. If I could be honest. And we're like, you know what though? She's here. We'll figure out the rest later. Let's bring her into church. And we were so excited and thanking God that she was there. And so we walk in, and right before we get into the sanctuary, there was an older woman in the church, and I love this woman. This woman loved God, bless her heart. But she comes up to our friend, this girl. She pulls out a $10 bill, and she hands it to her. And we're like, what's happening? <laughs> you know, like, is this your grandma? Are you guys going to lunch later? We were confused, and so we just looked at this lady, and this lady said, she said this, she said, here, I want you to have this. $10 bill so that you can buy the rest of your outfit. She said, I don't want to see you coming to church dressed like that ever again. And you know what? She never did. She never came back. In fact, to this day, I've never seen this girl ever again. That was some years ago. And I, in fact, I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's alive. I don't know where she's at because you know what she thought in that moment? Church is not big enough for me. And I got to tell you, church, I promise you, that I'm gonna do everything that I can. Our team is gonna do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen here because our church is big enough for you. It's big enough for the people in your life that are far from God, the people who don't act like Jesus yet because they don't know him. I'm just convinced today, if people knew my Jesus, they wouldn't act like that. They wouldn't dress like that. They wouldn't treat themselves like that. They would have more self-respect. They would love themselves a little more. They'd give themselves a little bit more grace, but they don't know him yet. We gotta stop judging people who don't know Jesus yet. That's not really our job. And I gotta tell you, our church is big enough for the people in your life, and that's what I honestly believe about people in the world. They just don't know if the church is big enough for them. There's a lot of people outside the church who have no community, and they're struggling in life, and they're not, they believe in God, but they're not here. Why? Because they don't know if church is big enough for them. And I gotta tell you today, it is. 
Jesus' church, it is. And so if that's you today, if that message is for you, I just want to tell you we love you. We love you. We're so glad that you're here. When you come here, you're going to get grace and truth, and you're going to get it in love. And if there's somebody in your life far from God, I want to pray for them right now. Again, if that's you, I'm going to pray for you. If there's someone on your corner card, I want to pray for them that they would know that Jesus' church is big for them. He's not shocked by the thing you're going through. It's why he went to the cross. It's why he died for you and he shed his blood so you wouldn't have to live like that anymore. And so Jesus, we just pray for people in our church family right now. People who feel like we can't open up and be real because we're ashamed and we think people are gonna gasp for air when they hear about what we're going through. God, I, I pray you'd help us Please help us not become like the Pharisees in John chapter 8. I don't want to be like that. I've been there. I've been that person too many times. Would we know that that doesn't impress you? When I gasp for air, when I'm quick to condemn because that's wrong, would we remember our story? And I pray that our story, when we recall the grace you gave us, that would motivate us to give grace away freely to other people. And so would we know today, God, your church is big enough for me you want me here. That's crazy. And God, we also pray for the people in our lives. I can think of a couple at the top of my head. They, they don't really think church is big enough for them. They don't think they belong. They might believe in you. I'm not even sure. I should probably check in on that. But we pray for these people in our life, God. These people on our corner card, in our family, at our workplace, our circle of friends, our cousin, our barista. I don't know. We just pray that they would see church differently, that we need grace and we need truth, and we're not here to stuff truth down our throat before being welcomed. It's good to be convicted, but not before feeling welcomed into your family. And so we do that now, God. We pray for these people. Give us the motivation to reach out to them, God. I love it on our corner card. It says, it says make a list, pray, and the number three is invest. Four is invite. I want to invest in people before I invite them. I want to earn the right to speak in their life. I want to earn the right to share my Jesus with them. And Lord, I just pray lastly that we would know if these people knew our Jesus, they wouldn't live like that. They would know you, they'd know the truth, and the truth would set them free. Lord, thank you for grace. Thank you for truth. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope that you were blessed by our time together today. Don't forget that you can also continue today's conversation throughout the week by downloading your weekly game plan at CaptivateSD.com or in the video description. We love you, church. Can't wait to be back with you next week in person or right here online.